think that the Christian character of Robert E. Lee is not just something that is a redemptive uh, uh, piece from that war and that era, but I think it's something uh, that we can all stand to know and to remember in this day and time. And Robert E. Lee, though, wait a minute, wasn't he on the side that was for slavery? Yes, the Confederates, and weren't they just like Nazis? Except that they enslaved and exterminated black folks instead of Jews, right? So how could Lee, especially as leader of the Confederates, they were called the rebels, right? Because they were rebelling against America and its constitution and trying to take it over. How could he of all people even be a Christian? Well, that's actually a composite of many such comments that I've heard through the years, especially recent years, about Robert E. Lee. Oh, that he also greedily and inhumanely hung on to his slaves as long as he could until he was forced to free them. And that was only after he personally whipped his own runaway slaves, whom he'd first had stripped naked, including one young woman. You're skeptical? Some of the people in this room I trust are skeptical of that. But this was all published in an abolitionist New York newspaper in 1859, right? And yes, it was an anonymous letter, but they wouldn't dare have published it in those fevered pre-war days if it wasn't 100% true, correct? Then another letter was published after the Confederacy was vanquished in 1866 by one of the victims who said Lee ordered him whipped and salt poured into his wounds as he stood there naked and those of that younger woman. Of course, General Lee, you would expect that he would lie about such crimes, correct? General Lee, one of the most decorated American officers of the Mexican War, whom Commander-in-Chief Winfield Scott called the greatest American soldier in the Army. The only man ever to graduate, or one of two, from West Point with zero demerits. Well, if you have any doubt that Lee was lying, the Washington Post and the New York Times now agree that he was. And that despite his stainless personal life from one end to the other and the contempt for these accusations from Lee's greatest and most studied biographer, Douglas Southall Freeman, this proves that he was lying because those newspapers, remember, are America's journals of record. Forgive my sarcasm, but I didn't want, as we journey today through the real life, the quite transparent, well-observed, much-documented life of Robert, Robert Edward Lee to do so without acknowledging and addressing, even if briefly, some of these recent accusations that I believe to be malicious and far off the mark. Today, though, I want to consider several real aspects of that life. Indeed, not necessarily those most written about or well known. I'll leave it to others in this conference and future conferences to discuss his, his military uh, record. But today I want to talk about Lee the family man. Lee the leader of spiritual revival in his army. Lee the post-war peacemaker. And Lee the godly example. Some of the diligent, devoted, long practice pursuits he somehow managed to squeeze into his busy schedule when he wasn't stripping, whipping, or otherwise torturing both male and female slaves. I should add that Lee's earliest memories of life were sitting on the knee of his mother as she read him the Bible the prayer book, and the catechisms. But first, let's get to know Lee, the family man. I'm just going to say up front here that this is a man who has had a direct impact on my life. What, 150 years later or more? Without a father from age two on, uh, Lee, Robert E. Lee probably was the greatest influence of Christian manhood and fatherhood on my life as I raised my daughter. Well, as the family man, he spent many years of his military career prior to the war between the states in lonely isolation from his family. Despite this, he and his wife Mary had seven children. For extended periods of time when he served at remote army outposts, they remained at beautiful Arlington Plantation, inherited from her family across the Potomac River from Washington City. But Lee visited them as often as he could, and he he penned a steady stream of letters to them throughout their separations. They offered counsel and instruction, but love as well. Think about these words as you picture Lee, you know, riding on Traveler into into war at Gettysburg and these, these other historic fields. 
I long to see you through the dilatory nights, he wrote his 14-year-old daughter Annie from his lonely Texas post in the early 1850s, nearly a decade before the Civil War. At dawn when I rise, and all day, my thoughts revert to you in expressions that you cannot hear or I repeat. I hope you will always appear to me as you are now painted on my heart and that you will endeavor to improve and so conduct yourself as to make you happy and me joyful all our lives. But only diligent and earnest attention to all your duties can accomplish this, end quote. As I've gotten to be, an, I used to be able to read those great. Now I'm an old man, I start crying at all, all of them. <laughs> He has received some criticism, perhaps with some justification, for continuing in a career that long separated him from his family. However, he viewed his responsibility to provide for them as paramount in importance. That's a lesson for some of us men. All his training and qualifications for for the military were as he believed himself ill-equipped to run a large plantation such as Arlington. But with all, his influence on his own children proved profound. Letters he wrote to his family following Annie, that 14-year-old girl, following her death later in 1862, while she was far from home and he was on a distant, bloody battlefield amidst the storms of war, illustrate both his tenderness toward them and the Christian faith that guided his convictions and his leadership of them. In the quiet hours of the night, when there is nothing to lighten the full weight of my grief, I feel as if I should be overwhelmed, he wrote to his daughter Mary Custis following Annie's death. But he reminded Mary Custis that the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. These are not oral histories, folks. These are letters that have been printed in many Lee biographies. He wrote his wife Mary at the same time or near that time, I cannot express the anguish I feel at the death of our sweet Annie to know that I shall never see her again on earth, that her place in our circle, which I always hoped one day to enjoy is forever vacant, is agonizing in the extreme. But God in this, as in all things, has mingled mercy with the blow in selecting that one who was best prepared to leave us. May you be able to join me in saying his will be done. Wow. Lee wrote Mary in 1863 following the death of their daughter-in-law and her infant children at the same time that he was grieving, quote, for our lost darling as a father only can grieve for a daughter It has pleased God to take from us one exceedingly dear to us, and we must be resigned to his holy will. She, I trust, will enjoy peace and happiness forever, while we must patiently struggle, struggle on under all the ills that may be in store for us. What a glorious thought it is that she has joined her little cherubs and our angel Annie in heaven. Thus is link by link the strong chain broken that binds us to earth and our passage soothed to another world. Oh, that we may be at last united in that heaven of rest where trouble and sorrow never enter to join in an everlasting chorus of praise and glory to our Lord and Savior. End quote. Robert E. Lee. I don't know if Ken Burns covered that or not. Well, he wrote uh, himself in a private letter to his wife, which he likely never dreamed anyone else would read, all of those things. And Mary Lee's biographer, Rose McDonald, wrote how General Lee's, quoting now from uh, Rose McDonald, his tenderness to his children, especially to his daughters, was mingled with a delicate courtesy which belonged to an older day than ours. He had a pretty way of addressing his daughters in the presence of other people. Where is my little Miss Mildred, he would say on coming from his ride or walk at dusk. She is my light bearer. The house is never dark if she is in it, end quote. 
Is it any wonder that that same Mildred, Lee's youngest daughter, cried out to her mother after he died, to me he seems a hero and all other men small in comparison. End quote. Her sentiments apparently would not change. She nor any of her three sisters ever married. Wow. I think maybe that's a reminder for some of us. You know, I've lived long enough now, Steve, Dale, Richard, we've lived long enough to see fathers estranged from daughters and granddaughters and so forth. So, hey, maybe let this be an opportunity. If there's somebody that, if you or they died today, (laughs) and it's left unresolved, or you have any regrets over what you said last, or what you've done for them, or how they felt about you, or what they thought you felt about them, Maybe today's the day to go over there. Maybe today's the day to pick up the phone. Robert E. Lee, the exemplar. How about the spiritual revival in Lee's army? The sweeping religious revivals in the Confederate armies, particularly Lee's army of Northern Virginia, comprise one of the great overlooked chapters of the war between the states and one of the preeminent spiritual awakenings in American history. The rough surroundings of wartime military camp traditionally prove spawning grounds for every conceivable vice that man can dream up. I'm sure our veterans in this room would probably not disagree. But Lee's devout leadership spurred contrary developments in his army. According to scores of eyewitness accounts, people ranked from general to private reported on these, he facilitated an atmosphere where Christian belief and practice flourished and contested with the horrid practices of war. So what did that spiritual movement look like? And this is a little bit of a composite that I drew from uh, individual accounts that I'd read. A frightened 16 or 17-year-old Confederate Army volunteer, and uh, Tom alluded uh, or referenced earlier how many boys went off to war. So, you know, Heck Thomas, one of the great heroes of Oklahoma history, helped found Lawton, was a 12-year-old Confederate courier uh, for the Army of Northern Virginia. But let's just say this was a older 16 or 17 year old boy that uh, would have found a very different scene than he expected. Many of the card decks he saw were tossed aside by repentant soldiers marching the trail to war. I guess maybe the connection to gambling there. We don't have any trouble with gambling in this state now though, do we? And often replaced by prayer books, pocket testaments, or catechisms. Not only was the imbibing of alcoholic spirits frowned upon by many in the army, but when stores of enemy liquor were captured, they were poured out onto the ground or burned rather than held up as trophies and partied with that night, and that by order of the boys' own commanding officers. Among the Confederate leaders, Lee, Stonewall Jackson, and Jeb Stewart, all had forsworn drinking any alcohol in their personal lives. Lee would not even allow it in his home. You know, no young person I've ever taken that I've ever known has taken their first sip of alcohol and proclaimed, I plan one day to become an alcoholic (laughs) or a drug addict or impregnated out of wedlock or to have an abortion or lose my family or freedom or die drunk in a car wreck or at an early age through liver failure. Anyhow, Robert E. Lee had figured that out. And unlike most any other military force of the day, women of ill repute were not welcome in the van that followed Lee's army. And if it became known that a soldier of the South, ranker or officer, was being unfaithful to a wife or causing a wife's unfaithfulness with his own actions, he risked cashiering out of the army. This 16 or 17 year old boy would learn to his surprise that aside from himself and his fellow Greenhorn volunteers, gambling and profanity were uncommon in this fearsome army. Soon he might be one of those whose captain professed belief in Christ after one of the camp's soul-searching sermons, called his company together, told him they had followed him into many hard-fought battles as well as into sin, and now that captain wished them to follow him into the blessed service into which he had just enlisted. The boy might see a log uh, chapel to his left, built by a Mississippi regiment, which happened, for its own worship activities, men streaming in and out of it seven days a week, 24 hours a day. In that chapel, he learned those Mississippians, half-starved already themselves, had emerged from a time of extended prayer, 
with the decision to give the entire rations allotted to them every tenth day to the hungry civilians of Richmond, a city few of them had ever even seen. Boy, that's a slap in the face to me as I think about, I complain about maybe what I get on that dinner table, but there's always something on that dinner table, not for these guys. Up ahead on a hillside to his right, the boy might hear a chorus of over 2,000 manly voices echoing off the surrounding hills as they sang General Lee's favorite hymn, How Firm a Foundation, in an open-air amphitheater built by a Virginia brigade. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in His excellent word. What more can He say to you than He hath said to you for whom for refuge to Jesus have fled. It just struck me. <laughs> I learned that hymn. I got interested in that hymn reading about Lee years ago. And now when my seven-year-old grandson Luke, that any of you other Facebook friends of me well know who Luke is, when I tuck him in at night, a couple of nights a week when he spends a night with us, this is one of the hymns I sing to him. And he's seven and he knows it. <laughs> Amazing. Well, through the months, this boy would witness the sermons and teaching of the greatest preachers in the South, Presbyterians like Robert L. Dabney, Beverly Tucker Lacey, James Henley Thornwell, Moses Drury Hogue, and Benjamin Palmer, Baptists like John Broaddus, co-founder of the Southern Baptist Convention, Robert Ryland, W.F. Broaddus, and J. William Jones, Episcopals like Brigadier General William Nelson Pendleton. Their common message, despite denominational distinctives, the proclamation of Christ and Him crucified. And now the once frightened teenager, callow and acne-faced, would likely join the large proportion of his company professing their own conversion in the next months and following their captain as he followed Christ, especially after the boy was handed a gospel tract one afternoon while slipping through the muddy camp, perhaps by none other than Stonewall Jackson himself. And if he later doubted the wisdom of his new path, difficult as it was, he might be confirmed or at least encouraged in it upon overhearing a chaplain tell Robert E. Lee of the many fervent prayers offered on his behalf and Lee responding in a choked voice. And this was an eyewitness account from several young men that overheard them at a campfire one night. This is what Lee said, Please thank them for that, sir. And I can only say that I am nothing but a poor sinner trusting in Christ alone for my salvation, and I need all the prayers they can offer for me. A sampling of the abundant contemporaneous accounts of the historical spiritual movement reveal its impact during and after the war. From 1861 to 65, Lee and the Southern Armies accomplished a cavalcade of legendary deeds while outmatched often to the extremity in nearly every way. First Manassas, the Seven Days, Second Manassas, Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, Spotsylvania, the Wilderness, Cold Harbor, among many others. Whilst doing so, they exhibited from the most senior commanders to the commonest foot soldiers in a conspicuous and consistent manner many of the primary attributes of Christian manhood. And I should add that they exhibited them as well in what they did not do as in what they did. Despite suffering at the hands of federal armies the most brutal prosecution of total war given high government sanction by a Christian nation in perhaps two centuries, never did Lee and the Confederate States military or governmental high command approve like behavior. The unfortunate instances where it occurred, and it did indeed occur on occasion, such as Lawrence, Kansas, Fort Pillow, Mississippi, Poison Springs, Arkansas, as mentioned by Tom, and Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, were isolated and unsanctioned. Even after federal generals such as John Pope and Benjamin Butler savaged the Confederate homeland civilian population, even when many Southern newspapers, political leaders, and some of Lee's own subordinate officers cried out for vengeance and retribution, when Robert E. Lee took the Army of Northern Virginia north into Pennsylvania for the Gettysburg Campaign midway through the war, he issued the famous General Order No. 73 to all his soldiers. And it read, It must be remembered that we make war only upon our armed men, and that we cannot take vengeance for the wrongs our people have suffered 
without lowering ourselves in the eyes of all his abhorrence has been excited by the atrocities of our enemies and offending against him to whom vengeance belongeth, without whose favor and support our efforts must all prove in vain. The commanding general therefore earnestly exhorts the troops to abstain with most scrupulous care from unnecessary or wanton injury to private property, and he enjoins upon all officers to arrest and bring to summary punishment all who shall in any way offend against the orders on this subject, end quote. And indeed, as some of you know, at least six Confederate soldiers were executed by firing squads during the Gettysburg pan campaign for vandalism, one of them for taking fence railing to kindle a fire. And yet, no doubt that fence railing was probably keeping the hogs or the cattle or something in for a family to feed itself. Tens of thousands of Southern soldiers drew strength and consolation from their faith to endure the many horrors of war while Southern fortunes prospered. They did all the more after events turned against the South. The benefits of the great revival in the Southern armies shone all the more after the war as thousands of Southern soldiers emulated the example of Lee, John Gordon, and others and applied their energies and talents to provide for their dependents and rebuild their land Though some former Confederate soldiers resorted to unlawful and even violent behavior following the war, no doubt many more would have without the profound influence of Lee and the Christian faith on them. And by the way, uh, one of the great uh, epics of the Civil War uh, written by uh, Pollard, E.M. Pollard, I think it was, yeah, it was, who was a Southerner, he flat out blamed Lee for losing the war because he said he did not fight a hard enough campaign in Gettysburg. He said he should have taken the torch and burned down the North. And he said he thought the South would have won. Would have won. He called it a milk toast campaign by Lee. Well, how about Lee the peacemaker after the war? Ironically, Robert E. Lee's greatest legacy is perhaps as a peacemaker rather than as a warrior. Not as well known, but I'm going to suggest greater and I dare say that legacy holds much import for us today as we resist the temptation. Are any of us bitter ever? Any of you fellows been bitter? Have you, have you been cynical? Have you had unchristian feelings toward individuals, organizations, government leaders, faces you see on TV <laughs> who differ with you, faces who catch a football or play a guitar? Lee's life, there's applications for us at every point today in the 21st century. Well, following the war, the South lay in rubble, its manhood decimated, a harsh federal military occupation further crushing it down, and financial opportunists descending upon it from across the United States and even Europe. If only Abraham Lincoln held the power to end or continue North-South hostilities before and after the war commenced, not even he possessed that power once it ended. Only Lee did. Many Federals desire the utter destruction of the South as a recognizable, not just nation, but culture. Bitterness and hatred, meanwhile, filled most con former Confederates. Lee recognized the issue was no less than the survival of the Southern people and their civilization. But wisdom formed his thoughts and actions. He rebuked younger officers who advocated continuing the war with guerrilla tactics. He refused to countenance or support large-scale immigration out of the South of Confederates to foreign lands. He urged Southerners to work lawfully and cheerfully within the existing laws of the United States to rebuild their fortunes and their land. And most of all, he beseeched them to do that hardest of things to do, especially when you're wounded and suffering, to forgive and forget wrongs committed against them by Federals past and present. He counseled one of his many lovely but bitter young female admirers, 17-year-old Christiana Bond of Maryland, according to her own written account, and I quote Christiana Bond, that Lee told her, I want you to take a message to your friends. Tell them for me that it is unworthy of them as women, and especially as Christian women, to cherish feelings of resentment against the North. Tell them that it grieves me inexpressibly to know that such a state of things exists and that I implore them to do their part to heal our country's wounds. When the legendary gray ghost, John Singleton Mosby, still unvanquished in the field after Appomattox with his rangers, 
sent Channing Smith, a decorated young soldier friend of Lee's, to ask the general who had already surrendered whether to surrender or fight on. Lee replied that he was under parole and was not allowed to give him any advice. A long moment passed at the doorway of Lee's house, alone with this young man. But general, the boy asked, what must I do? Channing, go home, Lee said. All you boys who fought with me helped to build up the shattered fortunes of our old state. Well, all the while, offers and opportunities cascaded in from around the South, across the U.S., and even other nations. Railroads, insurance companies, corporations of every stripe offered the Virginian positions of leadership. One wealthy Englishman offered him a sprawling estate in the land of Lee's forefathers for life at no cost. Leaders of the Democratic Party, most of them former federal military officers, urged him to accept their party's 1868 nomination for United States president and oppose Republican nominee U.S. Grant. And some of the North's most powerful newspapers cheered him on in print. But as often he did, despite his simple dignity and guileless ways, he surprised nearly everyone. He instead took the helm of tiny, war-ravaged Washington College in the backwater Virginia mountain village of Lexington, where Stonewall Jackson spent the decade before the war. With no assistant, a scant budget, and beset by the burgeoning health problems of his aging body, and by the way, among many other ailments, I believe he suffered a heart attack the day of the charge, Pickett's charge at Gettysburg. Lee set about rebuilding the school, placing special emphasis on what curricula would best prepare the young men of the South to rebuild their land. Yet many times in many ways he voiced his primary concern, and the Reverend Dr. Thomas J. Kirkpatrick professor of moral philosophy at Washington College recalled and wrote down Lee's words to him. Oh, doctor, if I could only know that all the young men in this college were good Christians, I should have nothing more to desire. Time and again, he counseled forbearance and forgiveness on the part of his students, friends, family, and people across the South toward mercenary northern carpetbaggers, self-serving southern scalawags, black freedmen, occupying federal occupation forces and union leaguers, and the radical Republicans corrupt, crushing Reconstruction, so-called, in general. The gentleman, he wrote, does not needlessly and unnecessarily remind an offender of a wrong he may have committed against him. He can not only forgive, he can forget, and he strives for that nobleness of self and mildness of character which imparts sufficient strength to let the past be but the past. A true man of honor feels humbled himself when he cannot help humbling others, end quote. No one ever tabulated how many thousands of letters he received and answered from Southerners seeking his counsel on what to do. Uh, his daughter Mildred talked about bringing bags in of letters that would accumulate wherever it, the mail came in, I guess in uh, Lexington, that, she, that they would help him uh, read through and, and write, uh, respond to. Whence the source of such convictions? Well, Lee himself recorded it among those many private journalings that no other person even knew existed until they were found in his beaten old leather case after his death. My whole trust is in God, he wrote in one of those journal entries, and I am ready for whatever he may ordain. In another entry, I prefer the Bible to any other book. There is enough in that to satisfy the most ardent thirst for knowledge, to open the way to true wisdom, and to teach the only road to salvation and eternal happiness. It is not above human comprehension and is sufficient to satisfy all its desires." End quote. Of course, he wasn't without opposition until, even until he died. Many of the radical Republican leaders, and that was the name they gave to themselves, by the way, wanted him hanged for treason. An austere congressional committee grilled him more than once in Washington seeking evidence with which to prosecute him. They failed at every turn as the actual constitutional course of Lee's actions became obvious even to those who despised both him and the Constitution. Famed abolitionist leader and liberator newspaper publisher William Lloyd Garrison decried Lee's place at the head of a college. Quoting Garrison now, who is more obdurate or stubborn than himself? 
cap letters himself. He at the head of a patriotic institution teaching loyalty to the Constitution and the duty of maintaining that union he so lately attempted to destroy. Has Lucifer regained his position in heaven? If the South could reasonably hope to succeed in another rebellious uprising and should make the attempt, who can show us any ground for believing that General Lee would not again act as Generalissimo of her forces, end quote. Yeah, that's a little preview of the 48ers that uh, Dr. Crow is going to talk about. <laughs> kind of a little tinge of those European revolutions there, that Generalissimo. But as Lee's peaceable, forbearing example became manifest, as well as the fruits of his leadership at resurgent Washington College, his legion of admirers grew, even in the North. Lee, the godly example, the last morning of his own life, Abraham Lincoln was given by his soldier son, Robert, a photograph of Lee. It is a good face, Lincoln said. It is the face of a noble, noble, brave man. I am glad that the war is over. Well, accounts of Lee's charity and kindness after the war around Lexington are legion. Two months after Appomattox, an African-American man strode boldly forward to take communion with the white members of St. Paul's Church in Richmond. Always before, the black parishioners took communion after the whites, sat in the gallery, were required to. The entire assembly, black and white, sat in stunned silence. Then Lee rose from his pew, walked alone to the communion rail, and knelt within feet of the black man. It was a singular demonstration for its place and time of the Christian principle of neither Jew nor Greek, neither male nor female, bond or free. His action led the rest of the congregation to move forward and receive their own communion with their black brother. When the aforementioned Pastor J. William Jones, Lee's wartime chaplain, saw him give money, saw Lee give money to a stranger in Lexington years after the war, Pastor Jones asked Lee who it was. One of, our old, one of our old soldiers, said Lee. When Jones asked which Confederate command the man served under, Lee replied, Oh, he was one of those who fought against us. But we are all one now and must make no difference in our treatment of them. Once again, I cringe at the contrast with my own sorry attitude and practice, my unchristian feelings toward those that disagree with me and have scarcely usually even offended me or offended me not at all. Lee established a ritual in Lexington wherein every year, and this is well told by Charles Braceland Flood in his classic book, Lee, the last year, one of the best books about Lee I've ever read. At Christmas time, he would ride through the town handing down presents to the often impoverished children, most of them their dad's dead from the war, from a large bag this and many other uh, episodes, as I said, uh, Braceland covers in the, in the Lee the last years. And then only moments before suffering the September 1870 stroke that would kill him, Lee and the vestry of his church realized they were far short of meeting the paltry salary required for Rector William Pendleton to continue in his position at the church. When all looked hopeless, according to others that were at the meeting, Lee, who was already donating much of his own meager subsistence to the church, announced, I will give that sum. By the time, he, by the way, he had a stroke on the way home from that meeting that he died from the next day. And it was pouring rain, it was cold. By the time of his death, most Southerners had followed Lee's example, remained in their homeland, pursued peaceable ways, and put their hand to the plow of rebuilding their country. I have never so truly felt the purity of his character is now when I have nothing left me but his memory, wrote the person who knew him better than anyone else, his wife Mary, to a close friend. God knows the best time for us to leave this world, and we must never question either his love or wisdom. This is my comfort and my great sorrow, to know that had my husband lived a thousand years, he could not have died more honored and lamented, even had he accomplished all we desired and hoped. End quote. He is an epistle written of God. Edward Gordon, Lee's former colleague at Washington College, wrote, and designed by God, and here's an important word, I think, for us Americans, 
to teach the people of this country that earthly success is not the criterion of merit nor the measure of true, true greatness, end quote. Well, after all the suffering, all the disappointment, all the loss and death and heartbreak, Lee left words near the end of his life that should offer great encouragement to us moderns, us 21st century folks, who believe the world's spiraling downward now, our country spiraling downward until cataclysmic destruction. To those of us who fear that the best days of our beloved America are behind us, those of us who despair the very future for our children and grandchildren in a land, in a world, rent with villainy, debauchery, and falsehood. So what Robert E. Lee wrote was found in that beat up old black bag that there's no evidence he expected anyone else ever to see this besides him and God, but he wrote these words, and so many of us now have seen it, and I close with this. The march of providence is so slow and our desires so impatient the work of progress so immense and our means of aiding it so feeble. The life of humanity is so long, that of the individual so brief, that we often only see the ebb of the advancing wave and are thus discouraged. Just as the dominant party cannot reign forever and truth and justice will at last prevail in a larger way, it is history that teaches us to hope. History, I tell my students, his story, win or lose, as men count it. I thank you.